I am Corey Shockey, the Deputy Director General of the International Institute for Strategic Studies, and this is our house podcast, Sound Strategic, where we showcase the extraordinary analytic talent of this fantastic organization. And today I have the great pleasure to have as my guest, Amanda Lapo, who is a research analyst in the sharpshooting defense and military analysis team here at IISS, the people who who write the military balance, the people who derive the underlying data for the military balance, and its online partner, the Military Balance Plus. Amanda, welcome to Sound Strategic, my friend. Hi, Corey. Thank you very much for having me. So I should have said that Amanda did her undergraduate work. She is Italian by nationality, did her undergraduate work at Luis Guido Carli University in Rome. And although her degree was in political science, I saw a suspiciously large amount of statistics and international political economy, which suggests to me that you were uh, headed towards a data-driven profession. Precisely. And I noticed the same pattern in your graduate work at King's here in London, where, let's see, you did intelligence and international security, right? Yes. For those of you who don't already follow her on social media, you should definitely go read her terrific piece on Spain's decision to join the Next Generation Fighter program that France and Germany have underway. And if you haven't already seen her video or read her terrific pieces on Venezuela, she has an extraordinarily wide span of control in this area of expertise. So what of your many areas of talent is in the news these days, Amanda? Um, so um, definitely Venezuela. Um, there is no, there's been no lack of news uh, from Venezuela, at least since the beginning of this year. And, but something that has struck me uh, quite recently is that in, in mid-August, Venezuela and Russia signed a um, military cooperation agreement um, that allows uh, worship visits in, for, in the ports of both countries. Um, Russia and Venezuela have long-standing economic and military ties. Um, but um, something that I found very interesting about this agreement um, is that tells me uh, something about both uh, countries at the moment. The first one is that there has been an expansion in the uh, cooperation between Venezuela and uh, um, Russia in the naval domain. Uh, traditionally, Russia has been supporting Venezuela with um, technology transferred, uh, platform exports, training, mm -hmm. and maintenance capabilities, uh, specifically, most predominantly, predominantly in uh, uh, the land and the air domain. Uh, but uh, at the beginning of the year, Russia said uh, it would be willing to support the expansion of Venezuelan Navy and the re-equipment of the Navy. Huh. And this is something relatively new. Um, in this case, though, we have to take into account uh, Venezuela's uh, disastrous uh, economic situation. And this uh, also tells me that for Russia, probably this is more a political, um, a political agreement uh, rather than a business partnership in terms of like uh, military industry and defense industry. Indeed, um, Russia with this agreement in particular will have access to Venezuela's port and have the capability to deploy in, in the region. Uh, projecting power and sending a clear political message to the U.S., especially in light of the rising tensions between uh, Venezuela and uh, the U.S. government. Indeed, at the beginning of August, um, the White House announced the action which freezing the property and assets of Venezuelan government in the U.S., and of those of any individuals who assist Venezuelan officials affected by the order. So a new round of sanction. Um, this, mom this morning, I was um, reading Reuters uh, Venezuela, and I noticed that um, Chinese companies uh, were actually uh, thinking of halting their uh, crude oil loading from, from Venezuela because they were very preoccupied about the sanctions. So although I think that our distinction must be made between a Russian private company and Russian state-run company, 
uh, Russian decision to keep supporting Venezuela military and economically, I think it's a pretty strong stance at the moment. And um, this inevitably makes me think also of Syria. Um, Russia has always been um, Assad ally since the beginning in, tw- in 2011. And uh, supporting the uh, supported the regime, uh, even though uh, even when everybody thought it was about to collapse, and uh, this would have actually brought to prevented the regime from indeed losing the civil war. Exactly, and um, uh, and they basically stepped in in 2015 with a military mm-hmm. intervention, and this some way somehow creates a pattern. A pattern. Um, and uh, although the situation in Venezuela is different because we aren't talking about uh, a military conflict at the moment, mm-hmm. um, it, we'll actually see, we can actually see how long, uh, how far, sorry, um, Russia will be able to go to support the regime and prevent a regime change as they did in Syria. So one of the things I learned from your work on Venezuela mm-hmm. is just how the regime keeps the loyalty of their military, that the combination of economic opportunities that aren't available to non-military people and also the infiltration or placement of Cuban intelligence officers throughout the ranks of the Venezuelan. So you have political commissars, they're just not Venezuelan. They're Cubans who are loyal to the Venezuelan regime Uh, watching for signs of political unrest. Yes. Talk a little about how that's playing out now that we're, what, six months into the the most intense phase of challenges to the legitimacy and to the power of the regime, of the Maduro regime. Yes. So um, Venezuela has uh, also um, long-standing military ties and um, with Cuba, not just with uh, Russia. And uh, I was talking to one of the Colombian defense attaché earlier this year, and he said um, that Cuban presence uh, in the uh, Venezuelan army is actually quite a common thing that has been going on for a long time. Um, mainly, we're talking about um, advisory um, in terms of like um, services provided by these uh, officers. Um, recently, has been reported by very um, by several news outlets that this um, Cuban officers might be also infiltrated in the National Intelligence uh, Committee, which is a military uh, defense intelligence committee, uh, which is also allegedly uh, performing uh, torture and threatening the lives of the um, Venezuelan soldiers who are suspected. Uh, to be um, plotting against the the regime. So we have, as I defined it before, a stick-carrot approach. So if on one side uh, the regime has been providing um, economic benefits, um, especially to the higher ranks in the armed forces, Mm -hmm. on the other side it's been like monitoring the situation and prevent dissidents to... um, try to organize coups uh, or uh, um, topple the, the regime. was very quick to crack down on a couple of independent military um, challenges. Indeed, indeed. Right, a few months ago. Yes. And how did you come to be working on Venezuela? Is that an extension of your work on, on naval assets? Like, how did you come to be interested in um, this? Corey, have, I think, a good anecdote on this. Um, <laughs> okay. So, basically, I studied my work on Latin America in general um, before joining the Institute when I was still working at uh, Jane's uh, because I was a Spanish speaker and uh, we were working on consultancy and then I kept working on uh, uh, Latin for the same reasons. Uh, but the passion, let's say, for Venezuela uh, started more or less two and a half years ago. I was in Lima, Peru, by myself and with my huge backpack. And uh, I just came back from this beautiful uh, holiday um, tra- on, on the Andes and we were just like tracking. And I left my friends behind. 
So uh, I've been advised at the time to just uh, ask for a driver because I was arriving by myself at night. Uh, Lima, it's a, it's a metropolis. So, of course, it's not the safest uh, place to be alone in a station at night by myself. And I met Renato, which was my driver. Uh, he was uh, the father of two, and his daughter lived in Venezuela, and she was studying medicine. And he said he was very concerned about the situation in Venezuela because, like, riots started at the time. There was violence on the street. And he was very, very concerned about the safety and security of his daughter. And um, therefore, I came back and I just started research it, researching. And I wanted to spread, let's say, awareness on this. And I found it very fascinating as well. Excellent. Um, and how did you get interested in defense analysis more generally? What drew you into this area of expertise? That's probably related more to my upbringing. Uh, my dad is a, be a very big fan of um, military history. Uh, so I grew up with all these books on, his, on the shelves in German, <laughs> in English. Um, so I think it was a little bit inevitable. We had this, such discussions on, at dinner table. So um, it just came naturally, I would say. <laughs> That's fantastic. And what's your favorite book in your field? So I would probably advise to read uh, The Forgotten Continent, A History of the New Latin America by Michael Reed who is um, the former editor of the Economist American Sections. Um, this is a revised version published in 2017. The original one was in 2007. And uh, basically this provides a good overview of uh, Latin America economic and uh, social landscape at the moment. Um, I quite like it because at the beginning of the book, the author sets a, quite an ambitious goal for its book, is, that is uh, not to find an overarching explanation for the problems uh, of Latin America in the economic and social realms, uh, but to consider many different factors, including historical factors, institutional factors, uh, religious and economic, and try to surpass also dependency theories. Although, very good book on this, sorry, I'm adding another one, <laughs> is uh, Open Veins of Latin America, written huh. by Eduardo Galeano. I don't know that one. It's very good. Of course, it's like, it, as, I, as I mentioned, it's just considered mainly one side, so dependency theory rather than the broader picture, but it's uh, a very histor good historical overview. Um, so, and has a, this book has a very interesting chapter on Venezuela in particular. So it starts more or less from the 1970s when Venezuela was one of the richest and most modern countries in Latin America. And it outlines how um, basically the government uh, failed at uh, diversifying the economy and relied too much on oil export, uh, even now before the crisis, um, oil export represented 95% of Venezuela overall exports. It's a lot of dependence Indeed. on a single aspect of the economy. Indeed. And then it also analyzed uh, what happened, the role of the military during Chavismo, even right before that with the first military coup in 1992, in which, uh, to which Chavez uh, took uh, part. Uh, and the failed coup in 2002, and makes a very fascinating point saying that the 2002 um, coup failed because um, the Pedro Carmona, who was actually leading the coup, failed at um, conquering the basically the troop um, alliance. So like the and so he was just basically supported by the generals, and this wasn't enough to actually topple uh, Chavez. And more broadly also how uh, Chavismo uh, short-sightedness in terms of economic reform increase inequality in the country. You know, I've always loved the comment by the former Saudi uh, oil minister who was arguing for diversification of the Saudi economy 15 years ago, <laughs> who said uh, that the Stone Age didn't come to an end for lack of stones. Indeed. <laughs> and the Oil Age isn't going to come to an end for the lack of oil. Yes. That, that energy producing countries ought to all be desperately paranoid about the alternative energy sources that human ingenuity is creating all Indeed. around us. I, mm -hmm. I agree. 
So what's the conventional wisdom in your field that's wrong? That's a very complicated question, I would say. Um, so basically, I would argue that people tend to underestimate how politicized and polarized the society is in Venezuela. Um, on one side, you have, of course, people who are actually um, either benefiting from the regime and they're a part of it, and uh, people who benefited from like Chavez and, and Chavismo in general policies, who are still supporting the regime. And on the other side, you have, of course, people that have been most impacted by the crisis that flee, fled the countries or live in very poor uh, condition. So I would argue that um, external actors have to be very, very careful in every, any sort of external intervention. Can either be sanctions, or we're talking about something more um, full, full on. Um, I do recall President Trump, uh, I was just reading Susan Glasser's really interesting profile about Secretary of State Pompeo in mm -hmm. The New Yorker, and she uh, recounts uh, the White House demanding options for military intervention in Venezuela, and then Secretary of Defense James Mattis just ignoring the request. Very good. Very well done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this can have uh, horrendous uh, relapses on Venezuela society. We're talking about, as I said, a very polarized country. And uh, I think... I saw yeah. a statistic that your average Venezuelan has lost 20 pounds over the course of the last it's year horrible. from deprivation. Yes. That, like, that's a terrible terrible sad statistic it is indeed. about the nature uh, the toll that the political contest is taking on average people yes and we're talking about also health care and like uh, of course food shortages so it's a it's a very disastrous uh, economic state and social situation that it will actually um, translate as translated already into a regional um, humanitarian emergency because we are talking about uh, actually the UNHCR uh, said that we will be 5.3 million Venezuelan refugees and migrants uh, by the end of 2019. Wow. Uh, this is just reviling the scale of Syrian refugees crisis. So the situation is increasingly um, getting worse and worse. <laughs> and what's your favorite work that you have done? Uh, once again, as I did prefer the book, I will probably choose uh, two. Um, always related to Venezuela. Uh, the first one is um, the presentation I had to deliver at a IISS um, corporate event earlier this year that looked at um, how, especially during uh, Chavismo, um, the armed forces have become a key constituency in the country, uh, increasing their uh, economic and uh, social importance in the life of the country. And I was also looking at how the crisis impacted the armed forces as well. And probably the second one will be the uh, blog that I've uh, co-written with Antonio Sampaio, which is a researcher who is a research associate for conflict security and development here at the Institute. And at that time, early in January this year, we were looking at the here and now. So basically the possible role of the armed forces in um, regime change in Venezuela. And he provided a brilliant explanation on what's the external perspective on the uh, conflict at the moment. So I'm a big fan of cooperating with other researchers and providing like a more well-rounded... Um, I too do a lot of collaborative writing because I just find it more fun to try and figure out where the Venn diagram overlaps between Indeed. my expertise and somebody else's expertise and insight. Yeah, and you learn something that you probably didn't know you wouldn't have by just doing it by yourself. So Yeah, it is actually one of the things I love about IISS, that we do a whole lot of mixing and matching of our respective talents um, to address problems better than any of us could individually. So, 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 favorite data visualization. So, 
casually and randomly, <laughs> I have here the military balance blast. <laughs> uh, just not to showcase uh, the output of our work at uh, BMAP. Which is IISS Defense and Military sorry. Analysis Team, I'm where sorry. Amanda contributes <laughs> her work. So here I have the project of the work of Lucy, which is our economist. Um, so here, here I have like a chart which actually shows um, Venezuela defense budget uh, starting from 2009 up until now. And um, what's it interesting to note is that um, Chavez and then Maduro uh, had a very generous defense procurement uh, policy, at least up until the collapse of the economy in 2014 that was derived by the fall of the oil prices. And indeed, in 2014, the defense budget and percentage of, uh, to the GDP was 2.4%. And the average in Latin America is actually 1.1, 1.2% of the GDP. Um, so this um, had um, a, an impact on like the morale of the soldiers back in the day. So you're providing them uh, some like good equipment, um, especially in that case for the National Guard, the law enforcement, and they were actually overhauling aging pieces of equipment. Um, and to keep, of course, the morale of the troops quite high and to be very ready militarily for any sort of aggression and for the narrative of like the US or uh, other uh, of any of its allies actually threatening Venezuela. Uh, but then, of course, it went, it, fall, it fell down very fast. And, um, uh, and in 2017, it was reduced to 0.5% of the GDP, so a sharp uh, fall in the investment and this had uh, as a result some consequences not only on the armed forces um, cap military capabilities per se but also on the life of the of the soldiers so um, this is creating further divisions and the regime so far has been very intelligent in like keep intelligent in keeping uh, the loyalty of the armed forces, but we'll actually see up until when they will uh, respond to that. That's right. The sand may be slipping through the hourglass on that one. Well, we'll see. Amanda Lapa, thank you so much for teaching us about uh, the deal between Russia and Venezuela on warship visits, the role that Cuban monitors play in helping the, Venezuela, the Maduro regime keep control of the military in Venezuela, for talking about Michael Reed's great book, Forgotten Continent, and what you learned from it. And can I just say parenthetically how much I love that your favorite book is one that is testing alternative explanations for the data. That seems... <laughs> yeah. So true to type. <laughs> uh, thank you. I haven't noted that. <laughs> um, and for talking about the um, politicized and polarized environment of domestic politics in Venezuela that's producing 5.3 million refugees, uh, the largest humanitarian crisis since the Syrian civil war. And lastly, for celebrating the work of your talented <laughs> colleague, Dr. Lucy Burrosudro in the defense team, who, uh, who visualized the defense spending of Venezuela over time for us and showed the collapse of it. And for your own analysis of what that will mean for the morale and potential loyalty of Venezuela's troops. Thank you so much, Amanda. And thank, thank you, you for your me. excellent work for this ball club. Thank you. Thank you.